I'm Jacob Van Loon. I'm joined in the booth by Reed Duke. We're about to bring you guys some semifinal action here at the tournament. There we go. We got it updated for you guys. And this is Yuzhan Zhu against Matt Zafera. And uh, Yuzhan is actually not playing Black Green Constrictor. He is also on Mardu Vehicles. This is a Mardu Vehicle mirror here. It is a mirror in, uh, in most ways, although, as you had pointed out going into the matchup, They've chosen different mana bases and different uh, four drops with Yuzhuan uh, still hanging on to the traditional Gideon ally of Zendikar, which was such a major player in the pre-Hour of Devastation world. Matt Severa instead going with Thought Not Seer. And now Yuzhuan got things started with a Thraben Inspector. It's going to make a clue. Matt Severa, no turn one play. I have to say I like Yuzhuan's side here. Um, between being on the play, being the top seed, I mean, he's hardly lost all weekend with a 14-1 and one record in the Swiss. But uh, also, I think Gideon is a card that's going to shine more in a removal-heavy mirror match like this than Thought Not Seer. In particular, both Fatal Push and Unlicensed Disintegration match up pretty well against Thought Not Seer. So while it is a powerful card capable of stealing some games when things line up well, I'd rather be on the Gideon side. There's also a lot of incidental damage that could happen in a matchup like this. And uh, Matt Samara, he's playing a lot of those deserts that deal him damage when he taps them for colored mana. Yeah, that's true. There is, there is a cost of playing those cards over just regular basic lands. All right, on two, we have Yuzhan playing a Scrap Heap Scrounger, and Matt has a Heart of Kirin. Yuzhan going to get in for four damage here. And a Toolcraft Exemplar advances the board state a little bit more. Yuzhan missing a land drop, though. Yeah, I have to say I like the mana a lot more on Matt's side. He's got all three colors of mana. He's hitting his third land drop. And Yuzhan is, you know, he's, he's down to one colored mana per turn, and it's painful to use. And something that's difficult for him is he has that clue, and it's so tempting to go and look for more colored mana, but at the same time, by doing so, he leaves himself open to that Scrap Heap Scrounger dying, and then he has access to no more colored mana. Yeah, that's a great point. Matt uh, casts the Toolcraft Exemplar, uh, gets its trigger, and then uses it to crew that Heart of Kirin and attack for four, then advances further with a Scrap Heap Scrounger of his own. So perfect for Matt, um, really taking advantage of the Vigilance Clause on Heart of Kirin attacking with it for four damage and holding it back as a potential blocker as well. And it's a, a nice way to kind of get your Scrap Heap Scrounger to gain the ability to block. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though it does beg the question, if uh, Yuzhan starts his turn by attacking with everything, will Matt even fire up the Heart of Kirin to a possible removal spell? Yeah, now that Yuzhan has hit that third land, it uh, opens up a world of possibilities of removal spells he may have in hand. attacking with just the Scrap Heap Scrounger here. Matt's going to call. Attempt to block with the Heart <laughs> of Garen. Okay, that's about the only removal spell that makes sense there. If it was a Braid, Fatal Pusher, Unlicensed Disintegration, he could kill it before blockers, but... The sorcery speed requires Matt Severa to activate the Heart of Kirin before Zhu can kill it. Yeah, so cut ribbons there for Yuzhan. That could also uh, represent some reach at a later point in the game, so let's not forget about that one. Now a pair of inspectors on the board for him. So Matt's mana does look a lot better this game. He's going to be attacking in here for six. Yuzhan does have some good blocks here, though. Yeah, I, I'd imagine the three bit inspectors are going to double up here, and even if Matt Severa points a removal spell at one, that's quite all right. Three bit inspectors have done their job. A thought not serious. He's a walking ballista and a PNLR here from Zoo. I think I'd be 
inclined to take the Pia. It's just a lot more of a mana efficient card against an opponent choked on three lands. Yeah, Walking Ballista, not very exciting when your opponent can only cast it with one counter. Now, the best case scenario for Zhu is to crack a clue and find Fatal Push. That would just be a super mana efficient way to uh, take out Thought Not Seer, get back a card, maybe work towards hitting a land drop, but only two copies of Fatal Push. It would take a stroke of luck for that to happen. Yeah, when you're falling this far behind, though, perhaps that's what you're looking for. It might be worth it to uh, gamble in that way. It's a familiar dilemma to have be missing a land drop with a clue. You, it's so tempting, as you mentioned, to want to crack the clue and find a land. But the danger is if you if you use a clue and don't hit, then you've spent an entire crucial turn in a tempo-based matchup not adding to the board. So he's able to get in for another three here with the Toolcraft Exemplar. Players are still in a racing situation. He also has available to him um, the ability to return Scrap Heap Scrounger from the graveyard. <clears throat> All right, so Matt Sparrow with another land here in the form of Ether Hub. Going to get an energy here. So pretty cool attack last turn. Zhu attacked the 3-2 into the Thought Not Seer because Matt Severa knew about walking Ballista in hand to potentially finish it off. Yeah, Zhu would have been pretty excited if Matt Severa had not known about that and he could have been able to take out that Thought Not Seer. Now Matt attacking for seven here, potentially putting Yuzhan down to four. Very dangerous place for Yuzhan to be, especially considering Matt has that ruins in play and also has access to cards like Disintegration in his deck. Another inspector here, going to make a clue. Matt Severa has won a Grand Prix with Mardu Vehicles. He's been playing this deck for almost its, the entirety of its existence. Definitely an expert in particular, adept at knowing when to switch between offense and defense in a mirror match situation like this. And I love the way that he has uh, played a little bit fast and loose with his own life total at times in favor of being able to put the pressure back on Zhu. Um, you know, putting putting maximum pressure on an opponent drawing out of a mana screw is, is just fundamental good magic. Through our Aether Sphere Harvester here for Yu Jean Chu. And uh, pretty powerful card there. It, uh, you know, has some lifelink, but with the Ramanap Ruins and the uh, Unlicensed Integration there, that's going to be five damage, and Yu Jean's life total was only four, so that's good enough to bring us to a second game here. Matt Severa able to. Uh, pick up game one against our first seed here. Both players going to sideboard now. All right, looking in on the matchup between of Corey Baumeister against Collins Mullen. Collins Mullen with a very off the beaten path green-white ramp deck against another rogue deck in the form of Manuel Eldrazi played by Corey. Looks like Walking Ballista there going to take out a selfless spirit. Corey still with a healthy board. Collins, only two lands in play. Um, not exactly what he wants to be doing here. More or less the opposite of a healthy board. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty non-functional draw, it seems, from Collins Mullen's side. We right. had predicted this to be a, a matchup that would favor Mullen, but that is definitely one way to overcome a bad matchup is have your opponent have a, have a weak draw. Yeah, we could, uh, now we might stay over here and uh, watch Collins Mullen and Corey Baumeister battle it out instead of watching more of the uh, Mardu Mirror. Uh, let's take a look at the sideboards that these players brought this weekend. We have, uh, Collins Mullen has a pretty exciting card in his sideboard in the form of Regal Caracal. Yeah, we saw that do work uh, against Ramanop Red in the, the last round of the Swiss. Um, very powerful card at stabilizing the board. Unfortunately, in this matchup, I think Corey's, Corey has enough of an air force, enough creatures that don't get blocked on the ground, that it's not going to be quite at its best, though it might be a consideration anyway. 
Um, one of the most exciting cards we saw out of a sideboard was Oblivion Sower. In the quarterfinals, uh, Collins Mullen was able to attack with Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger, exile his opponent's top 20 cards, and then cast Oblivion Sower and put all of the exiled lands into play. Wow. And then he tapped six lands and cast Linval the Preserver. Mm, so that's a big turn. Yeah, it was uh, probably the most exciting turn I've watched this weekend. So some really cool stuff that Collins' deck is capable of. Um, looking at the sideboard, though, not much action uh, in terms of cards that are powerful against Corey's Mono White Eldrazi deck. Uh, what do you see there from Corey's sideboard for a matchup like this? Well, the big one is that he'll be going up the four, full four copies of Warping Whale. The most important mode of that card being counter target sorcery. So that means approach of the second sun, fumigate, de descend upon the sinful. A lot of Collins' most powerful cards in the matchup are sorceries and being able to counter them at the low cost of two mana is just exactly what Cory Baumeister wants. Yeah, even being able to counter one of these ramp spells seems really good for Cory. I mean, hitting an Hour of Promise with something like Warping Well just seems backbreaking. Yeah, Hour of Promise too, that's a great point. I expect he'll bring in Cast Out as well. Um, pretty versatile answer card that can take out a big Eldrazi. Can also just cash it in to exile one of those three mana ramp spells like Gift of Paradise. Um, and there's not all that much Corey has access to. It's, there's a big gap between how good his best cards are going to be and how bad his worst cards are going to be, with a lot, of his, uh, a lot of his deck being geared at creature defense, stuff like Matter Reshaper, Sunscourge Champion. Those are not the most exciting cards when you're trying to pressure a ramp deck. Yeah, neither of these players have too much in the way of uh, sideboard action. And I think that's one of the advantages of playing a rogue deck like Mono White Eldrazi or Green White Ramp is that people build their sideboards specifically to beat, you know, the mainstream decks of the format. Decks like Red or decks like Team or Energy. And when you play a deck like Mono White Eldrazi or Green White Ramp, it's much less likely that you're going to run into focused sideboard cards that are aimed at beating you. Yeah, I'd be very surprised if either player had extensively tested this matchup. It's certainly an odd one. Both these players have, uh, you know, hedged a lot against decks like Red or and or Teamer when we look at their sideboards. They have uh, cards that are good against control players. But somehow, you know, Cor Corey didn't set himself up for the green-white ramp matchup. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of setting up, I think Corey's best plan for this matchup is to try to put some kind of board together where he can pressure Collins' life total and make the game come down to a single turn where Collins is going to be leaning on an Approach of the Second Sun or a Fumigate, one of those expensive one spell per turn type sorceries. And if Corey can have a Warping Whale at the crucial moment, then maybe he can uh, win a game that would otherwise look pretty bad for him. Thought Not Seer, of course, another tool to take away uh, a big threat or punch a hole in Collins draw. Yeah, the Thought Knots here, we've seen that card be really good against the ramp decks this weekend because you know when you're playing a ramp deck, oftentimes you have, you know, one payoff spell. So you're you know, you're casting all these ramp spells, you hope to eventually cast that Ulamog, and if they cast Thought Knots here and are able to take that out of your hand, then all of that ramping was for naught. Meanwhile on Collins' side of the matchup, he doesn't really care how the early turns go. His priority is just to establish his mana and get to a point where his deck can just over overpower Corey's. Um, he doesn't care if he's got you know his particular payoff cards in his opening hand. He knows they'll come eventually off the top of his library. He just wants mana, mana, mana. Make his land drops. Have a three mana ramp spell. Hour of Promise would be great. Um, but you know, just basically looking for a functional draw, which he wasn't able to come up with in game one. Corey with the Shafet dudes into an inspector makes a clue. Collins, still no play on turn two. Looks like does not have many turn two plays. Corey getting in for one here. Passes the turn with mana for Warbing Whale, potentially. Also had a selfless spirit in hand, but. He might value the ability to crack the clue token and, and look for a land drop more than getting the Selfless Spirit onto the battlefield. 
Yeah, if he doesn't have a third land, that could be crucial here. And still no third land after all that digging. All right, well, we might see a couple, a pair of non-competitive games before we, we go to number three here. Not that Corey's out of it yet, but this is not the start he wants, uh, just falling terribly behind against a deck that's more powerful in the late game. Yeah, now uh, Corey really needs to find that third land if he wants to find his way back in this game. He's going to attack for another one here, but looks like Collins is kind of running away with it. Selfless Spirit comes down. He's playing a little bit of pressure. Where he does have a, a pair of warping wells in hand, but they're not hitting a third land drop here. He has all these cards draining in his hand. All right, so gift of paradise there for Collins Mullen on that forest. And closer and closer to his top end now. Sacrificing the clue. Yeah, you saw him tap three mana there, floating a white so that he doesn't have to take a pain from Chef at Dunes. Nice, careful play. Now uh, an inspector of his own and a clue. Corey's still without the third land here. Corey only able to manage a very meager offense here, barely outpacing the life gain on Collins Mullen's side of the battlefield. Gets in for two in the air. Collins Mullen falls to 19. Corey still at 18. Corey goes to his discard step and discards a matter of shaper. Yeah, he elected to do that rather than cast another selfless spirit. Holding up Warping Whale, a priority for him here. Another clue getting sacrificed there for Collins Mullen. We see he drew Oblivion Sower, so he did bring the Oblivion Sowers in here. Yeah, if I was in uh, Mullen's position, I would definitely want to prioritize payoff cards that are not sorceries because it puts you at a big disadvantage if, if you're spending so hard to assemble your mana and then your opponent can trade at such a uh, efficient rate for your payoff cards. I, I wouldn't even be surprised if he completely changed the game plan of his deck, taking out the approach of the Second Sons and bringing in mostly creatures as, as ways to uh, win the game. Yeah, it seems really wise. and it, I mean, as a result, you see Corey has kind of, you know, changed his deck in such a way that it's really resistant to that approach to the second zone strategy and Collins Mullins recognizing that he decides okay I'll just take the sorceries out of my deck that's great so Corey uh, with another inspector here actually taking a closer look at, at Mullins deck list his uh, he's a bit different from some of the other green white ramp decks we've seen on camera over the course of the weekend he he doesn't look like Approach the Second Sun is, is his win condition at all. He's more oh, of wow. just a traditional ramp deck with uh, Ulamog and Worldbreaker, which should put him in an even be better position for this matchup. So my apologies for uh, focusing so much on Approach. <laughs> uh, Warping Wheel is still a very powerful card in the matchup. Yeah, as you mentioned, Hour of Promise is going to be a key card in, in these green-white ramp decks, regardless of what their end game is. Uh, similarly, Descend Upon the Sinful, really, really good against Corey since it circumvents Archangel Avacyn and Selfless Spirit. And Corey still, without that third land, at this point it's almost becoming comical. And now uh, I'm sure that the top four cards will all be lands just as a way of torturing Corey Baumeister. It's the way it is. <laughs> Worth noting, though, Collins... Didn't draw his third land in the first game. <laughs> All right, picks up two. Let's make an energy there from the ether hub. 
Oblivion Sower. Great card. Providing a ton of advantage. Now Collins has all the mana in the world to do whatever his heart desires. Yeah, and the things he is working towards, three copies of Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger, three World Breaker, two Descend Upon the Sinful, two Walking Ballista, which uh, can scale as the game goes on, using it either as early defense or a win condition once the game gets to this point. And then plenty of card advantage, ways to see more cards in his library, cracking clue tokens off Weirding Wood, Thraben Inspector. All right, so here we see a Thought Not Seer from Corey Baumeister. Does Collins have something to play in response? He does, and it's a cast out. He's going to use that to exile the Thought Not Seer. And then he reveals a hand of Descend Upon the Sinful, Quarantine Field, and a pair of lands. Oof. So that's the familiar kill Thought Not Seer with the trigger on the stack. That means Collins will draw his card first, and then Corey will be able to take his pick. Yeah, a little bit odd, but he, he did want to prevent Corey from taking the cast out that was in his hand, so. Corey gonna take that quarantine field. Extremely powerful card with Collins' access to this much mana. Collins could use it to remove a huge number of non-land permanents from the game. Oblivion, so we're attacking now. Something we've seen over the course of uh, the weekend watching Mullen and other green-white ramp players is at a certain point they start putting those deserts to use. They're in the deck for uh, to support Hour of Promise, but there's nothing stopping you from just sacrificing a couple of Hashup Oasises to win a close race. It's a card you don't expect to be relevant, and uh, especially when you're playing a deck like this where you don't really have much to do with your early turns. You find yourself in situations where you're susceptible to reach, and Oasis is a great way to get yourself out of that range. Thought not seer here for Corey. Uh, gets the Descend Upon the Sinful out of Collins Mullins' hand. Corey what? doing an admiral job battling back here. Mullen... Uh, has had a great start doing exactly what his deck wants to do, but he hasn't found Ulamog yet, so that means the door is still open for a Cory Baumeister comeback. Cast out. Exiles Thought Not Seer. Mullen cycles a land. And another attack here from the Oblivion Sower. Yeah, a really nice sideboard card that you had mentioned as a consideration for Mullen here. Regal Caracol coming in. Again, focusing on non-sorcery payoff cards. Yeah, and uh, that represents a lot of power for five mana. You know, it's seven points of power. It also gums up the ground, uh, prevents a lot of Corey's offense from working. Corey does have access to flyers in the form of Archangel Avacyn and Selfless Spirit, but now it's going to be almost impossible to race because those lifelinking cats get completely out of hand. He has a great setup here if he was able to find Archangel Avacyn. Transforming that would wipe up the Regal Caracol and its tokens, and he would have a nice potent flyer to be able to attack in. He doesn't have that, though, so he's going to have to win the uh, hard way, and... Now Sheffet Dunes on Collins Mullen's side of the battlefield can really help him with the race. Five creatures on his side. And with the lifeline, it's going to be really hard for uh, Corey to find any way back in this game, even if he is able to clean things up now. Matter of Shaper and a Selfless Spirit. Not quite enough. The Cor good news is with a bunch of creatures, complicated board state, and two selfless spirit on Baumeister's side. He has a nice ability to fog most of Mullen's attack at the cost of just one selfless spirit. You know, just quite simply put, put his four creatures in front of the four biggest attackers, sacrifice one selfless spirit, and uh, that's the only creature he'll lose that combat. 
he gets to prevent some lifelink in doing so also. That's right. A nice interaction that Real Caracol has with itself, you know, giving uh, other cats lifelink. Right, so Collins decides to attack with Oblivion Sower in a single cat token. He wants to attack with enough that it makes, that incentivizes Corey to lose a selfless spirit, but not so much that he loses a large amount of his board at, at low cost. For example, you know, having Regal Caracol blocked by Matter Reshaper is not exactly a profitable trade by Col for Collins. And this is uh, a nice play from Collins because it's an attack for seven. Corey's at seven. Seems wise. Matter of Shaper dies. It's a spawning bed, which will enter the battlefield directly. It's a lot of blockers. But let's keep in mind, it's not just the battlefield that Corey Baumeister has to manage here. There's also the fact that Collins Mullen can find Ulamog at any point in this game and uh, put it completely out of reach. So... It's not only that Corey Baumeister is losing on the board, but also the game's on a, on, a, on a clock, and he has to win quickly if he wants to win at all. Another copy of Oblivion Sower there for Collins Mullen. Corey falling further and further behind. Corey really needs to get off to an aggressive start if he wants to have a chance in a matchup like this. Doing a good job, though, trying to find his way back into this game. Here's another matter of shaper. And no good attack here for Corey. One, two, three, four, five attackers on Mullen's side of the battlefield. Chef at Dunes can be activated, so can Hush Up Oasis. If two creatures are able to get through, it could be lethal. And so imagine he uses the Chef at Dunes and the Hush Up Oasis targeting one of the, uh, well, we'll say for the sake of argument, Thraben Inspector. Attacks with all five creatures. He'll force Corey to have an instant there to survive. Comes in with both Oblivion Sowers. Corey's going to stasis snare one of them. Probably a good thing he didn't go for that all-out attack if Corey did have stasis snare. He would have risked a lot of his board to do so. So uh, Corey's chump block the matter shaper finds him an Eldrazi displacer. And you can see the first thing Corey did was pick up and read Oblivion Sower. That's to find out whether it enters the battlefield trigger or a cast trigger. It is a cast trigger, so Eldrazi Displacer does a fine job of managing that. Here's a world breaker now for Collins Mullen. Yeah, big, big reach blocker here. Collins doesn't have um, Sanctum of Ugin, so he's not able to go for Ulamog, uh, and the game's going to continue, but that's just one more one more thing that Corey Baumeister is going to have a tough time slogging through. Yeah, and the fact that it was able to get the Stasis Snare off the table means you know, Worldbreaker is doing a lot more than just destroying a land in this game. It's also adding an additional five points of power to the table. where he has you know, two activations of this displacer at his disposal. But the, the all-out attack from Collins is looking more and more enticing. Every turn, it seems that the, the number of blockers Corey has decreases and the number of attackers that Collins has increases. Displacer does make things very complicated, though, for everyone. It does. I mean, the, the most 
basic move here for, for Mullen is to attack with the three big creatures. And Corey can blink two and then either take five or, or, or block one with one of his three creatures. But Collins, of course, going to take his time, think through all the possibilities. He has two deserts to work with here, as well as six attackers. On the board, Corey can answer five. Alternatively, he could sacrifice his spawning bed for additional blockers. <laughs> Funny enough, you saw <laughs> Mullen sacrifice Corey's land that he had picked up off of Oblivion Sower. Gets in with uh, four creatures here. So I like this Mullen targeting Regal Caracal with Hashep Oasis. Corey doesn't want to blink that one. Most certainly not. We give Collins more cats to work with. So I think we're going to see one of those big blocks that ends with Cory Baumeister using a selfless spirit. He can kill one of these creatures if he wants. Probably the Regal Caracal is the most likely option. Yeah, there's a lot going on here on the table. The Displacer could also make things quite interesting. Especially if he's got all those Psyops and he's not using their power in combat, he could conceivably sacrifice them for an activation. Yeah, this makes a lot of sense. So block the three biggest ones with little creatures and triple block the Regal Caracal. The outcome is effectively going to be a selfless spirit trading for Regal Caracal. Yeah, it's a great deal for Corey. Yeah, Corey doing a pretty good job of working his way through this. With the Shafet dudes that he has, this board is getting pretty dangerous. He's hanging on, which certainly is step one here. The longer you survive, the more possibilities open up for you, and anything can happen in a complicated game like this. However, he, he does have to win the game at some point. There, Collins has a lot of really powerful draws from a situation like this where he has all of his mana available to him. Corey finally starting to attack again. Gets in for two with that selfless spirit here. Now has access to nine lands. That's three Eldrazi Displacer activations. Precarious situation for everyone now. Yeah, geez. Collins Mullins must be thinking... I thought this was going to be the easy game. My opponent stalled on two lands for quite a few turns. I had a great start, but he just hasn't been able to put Corey away. Yeah, this is surprising to me even. I, I thought this game was over on the fourth turn when Corey was unable to find those lands. And I mean, Collins, he, he found some top end. He's been doing work. He had a world breaker destroy a stasis snare. He hasn't been able to find Ulamog, the Cecil's Hunger, which probably would have put away the game pretty quickly. But besides that, he's really just had it all. So there, Corey chump blocks one creature, blinks the other two with Eldrazi Displacer, and then he sacrifices the Eldrazi Scion that blocked for one extra mana and uh, goes ahead and blinks away Mullen's cat token. Looks like Corey found another copy of Eldrazi Displacer. Collins with another inspector here. With all these lands in play and uh, all of these deserts, even something as small as an inspector could make a difference. <laughs> Corey's going to be attacking here with Eldrazi Displacer and Selfless Spirit. Collins goes ahead and takes five damage. Yeah, the Eldrazi Displacer in a, in a drawn-out game like this where both players have access to a lot of mana, just so powerful. Makes it, you know, hard for Collins to attack and also virtually impossible for him to block. If he was to try to pass with that Worldbreaker, 
Baumeister could easily just blink it at the end of the turn. It comes back into play tapped. And the Flyers are free to come in. El Dreyer's Displacer, another really powerful car that we haven't seen a ton of as of late. It's been seeing a lot of play in modern. <laughs> All right, weirding wood here for Collins. It's a redraw, <laughs> another redraw, Scattered yeah. Grove. Oh, and there it is, Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. The card we've all been waiting for, at least the card that Collins Mullen has been waiting for <laughs> for upwards of 10 minutes now. Yeah, I think he has plenty of mana to cast it, even after spending all the mana this turn digging through cards. All right, so one target for sure will be the Eldrazi Displacer. And I like targeting the Selfless Spirit now. Corey Baumeister does have the ability to blink the Selfless Spirit, but he also wants to blink some of those attacking creatures in order to not die this turn. Yeah, his uh, plan for victory looked decent, but eventually Collins was able to find that Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger, and it's really hard to come back from your opponent casting that spell. Corey, with some careful planning, he drew a second copy of Eldrosti Displacer, didn't cast it. That's uh, play around any sort of big board-changing effect, like an Ulamog trigger or a Fumigate or a Descend Upon the Sinful. Um, he wanted to have one in reserve, and he will have one in reserve, although at a certain point he's just overpowered. We have to remember he's down to seven now. Collins now attacking with Worldbreaker, Oblivion Sower, and his Inspector. Is there any line of cards you th could think of for Corey that would allow him to get out of a situation like this? Or Man, it would be tough. I mean, if he could draw a Stasis Snare for the Ulamog, use his remaining tokens in Eldrazi Displacer to manage the other creatures for a turn or two, find, uh, find additional removal spells, Avacyn, maybe the Fog a turn. Uh, he, has he has access to one Declaration in Stone, which could get both the Oblivion Sowers in one go. So I, <laughs> I don't think there's any single card that can get him back in this game, but maybe there's a, a run of draw steps that allows him to survive. Looks like you drew a Thought Knot Seer here. Not the best card when your opponent doesn't have any cards in hand. Displacer. So he'll, he'll likely have to displace the Ulamog before combat. Then he can use one of the Scions to block, blink another attacker. Yeah, I mean, it continues to keep him alive for what it's worth. Arlton Smullen, shortcutting there, the Weirding Wood, tapping the land after casting it. Sacrifice the Clue. Goes into combat. Corey uses Zildrazi Displacer. He's going to go ahead and tap down that Ulamog. Collins attacks with all of his five power creatures. Corey, looking for a way to hold on for a little bit longer. Well, this game looks like it could be over at any moment, as it has for a number of minutes, though. Of course, we're <laughs> so you see Mullen lining up Corey's blocks for him. Corey says, yeah, I guess that's the only thing I can do. It's interesting. Uh, well, the Eldrazi, the fact that it's when you cast and not when it enters the battlefield is usually such a nice advantage, but when you're facing up against the Eldrazi Displacer, it becomes a bit frustrating. Yeah. Actually, it looks like Baumeister is considering the possibility of just going down to one life. Yeah, that's what he's going to do. And one of the major dangers of that is that something as uh, 
harmless as that inspector on the other side of the table becomes a major danger. Wow, another world breaker here for Collins. Corey with no dedicated board sweepers in his 75. Declaration in stone might be his best draw step here. It looks like he just found the land. Yeah, that's it. Took wow, a lot, a but, he, but <laughs> you finally uh, took a game off of Corey Baumeister here. Nice job to Collins Mullen. Yeah, that's crazy because that's a matchup we really expected to be in Collins' favor by quite a lot. And Corey's draw there, I mean, he had a lot of trouble being able to uh, you know, take out a player who didn't have third land for quite some time. Corey's going to get to be on the play here in the third game, but uh, you know, hopefully we get a good one. We saw game one here, Collins stuck on two lands for a very long time. Then game two, Corey was stuck on two lands for a very long time. You see our other side of the bracket wrapped up there. Matt Severo won his Mardu Vehicles mirror match 2-0. He's on to the finals. Not the first time he's reached the finals of a standard Grand Prix with Mardu, Mardu Vehicles. Could be pretty impressive if he's able to win two different Grand Prix tournaments with the same exact deck in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, and if, if Corey Baumeister is able to win, we would have two recent Grand Prix champions facing off in their specialty format against one another. But also, it would be, we've discussed this earlier, but it would be the fifth North American Grand Prix in a row where the finals featured Corey or his brother. Wow, that's <laughs> incredible. That's a dominant streak. You know, Brad's been around for a really long time. You know that, obviously. Um, been doing really well at constructed tournaments, but Corey's kind of new. And when I mean, you might have known Corey, you, I'm sure you've seen him at, you know, an occasional Pro Tour. Sometimes he'll go to a Grand Prix. He generally does pretty well, but I think, you know, Corey hasn't really been a very well-known Magic player up until super recently. And I think even after his top eight in Minneapolis, we were like, oh, cool, the brothers both top eighted. But it wasn't <laughs> like, oh, Corey. And now that Corey top eighted again, and here he is top eighting again, I think people are starting to realize, oh, yeah, <laughs> this Corey guy. Yeah, you know, in the old days, it all always used to be, oh, Brad Nelson and his brother. But now, yeah. like you said, Corey Baumeister not just has an identity of his own, but he's one of the absolute best players in the country, potentially in the world. Um, yeah, you know, I, I had a conversation with him after his uh, top four berth in Grand Prix Denver, and he's like, yeah, I, I, I only recently started signing play match with my own name rather than signing Brad Nelson's brother. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a big, big move for him. I feel Certainly like ha well deserved. Having a brother is uh, of tremendous value when you're trying to get better at games. And uh, it also, I think, makes you perhaps a more competitive person in general in that regard. I know you have a brother who plays a lot of Magic. I grew up with two brothers. I played Magic with them. Um, brothers are great. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, you hit it with the, the competition aspect there, always yeah. having somebody that you want to outdo drives you to, to really try your hardest in activity like magic. Yeah, shout out to my brothers. <laughs> shout out to Ian, your brother too. That's right. <laughs> so now we're about ready for a game three here where we'll find out if Corey Baumeister or Collins Mullen will make their way into the finals here at Grand Prix DC to face off against Matt Severa and his innovative Mardu Vehicles deck that features Thought Not Seer and many deserts. Again, this is Jacob Van Lunen alongside Reed Duke bringing you coverage of the semifinals here at Grand Prix Washington, D.C. This is the third game of a matchup of Corey Baumeister on Manuel Eldrazi against Collins Mullen on Green-White Ramp. We came in thinking Collins Mullen was going to be a big favorite in this matchup. Now we've seen two, two games. Granted, both games went off to uh, awkward starts with one, one player or the other missing land drops. But having seen game two play out and go so long, there's certainly hope, if not more than hope, on Corey Baumeister's side of the matchup. I think that, uh, you know, we were kind of tricked into thinking that this was just a tremendous matchup for Collins in many ways because we're so used to ramp decks preying on mid-range decks. 
and maybe the fact that Corey has access to cards like Thought Not Seer and has a decent number of flyers, that might mean that Corey is capable of a little bit more than the average mid-range deck in a matchup like this. I think it's also a uh, symptom of exactly what Collins Mullen has brought to the table. And uh, it's not like certain ramp decks we've seen in the past where, you know, for example, you're primeval tightening it to Valakut and suddenly you're dealing 56 damage to your opponent um, once you actually assemble your game plan. Collins is ramping into creatures that actually can be beat in a fair fight. I mean, we saw him that game attacking with a bunch of 5-7, five, 5-8 five, creatures on the ground, Regal Caracol. These are his payoff cards, and Corey Baumeister with uh, powerful cards on his own side of the battlefield, Archangel Avacyn, Eldrazi Displacer, Selfless Spirit. He can fight fair for a long time if Collins doesn't find Ulamog. And that's one of the major things, though, is that a big part of Corey staying in that game for as long as he did was the fact that he was able to fade that Ulamog. If he can dodge the gigantic Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger, then that's definitely going to be a big thing for him. But if Collins has that and has the ramp that he needs to get to it, it's going to be really hard for Corey to win the game. It is going to be hard. It's not impossible for him to beat Ulamog with uh, Eldrazi Displacer or one of the Exile effects, but that's we're, we're talking about if it's like nothing, 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 Ulamog, nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing, maybe can, Corey can win. But if it's a context of a good draw where Collins is making good plays on every turn, he has other creatures on the battlefield, the, just the, the sheer impact of Ulamog coming down and Exile and Corey's best two permanents, it's almost impossible to overcome in a close game. Here we have Corey uh, casting Walking Ballista on his second turn after cycling cast out on the first turn. Collins, no play on the first or second turn. Is Corey about to miss third land drop again? Corey attacking for one here with Walking Ballista. Forced to pass the turn. Wow. Missing both a third land and a source of colorless mana. Okay, Collins with uh, his third land here. Let's see what ramp spell he has. That's a gift of paradise. Takes one to cast it, gains three up to 21. And Eldrazi displaced there for Corey. Does find the third land. Unfortunately, still no colorless mana for him. And, you know, you mentioned it before. He may be a single color deck, but he's essentially a two color deck because colorless mana is very important for Corey's strategy. Yeah, and I'm catching a glimpse of his hand. He would absolutely love to spend his next turn casting a Thought Not Seer, but that requires him drawing a source of colorless mana. Um, so not only does it have to be a land, but it can't be a basic planes. Two Thought Not Seers in hand for Corey Baumeister. And that's really strong against the deck like Ramp, where you know they only have so many cards that actually matter. And if he can have those Thought Not Seers backing up some early aggression, he's going to feel really good about his chances. But here he's already, he hasn't applied much pressure. You know, he played a one power creature on the second turn, and it took him to, until the fourth turn to put a three power creature onto the table. I mean, that's not even impressive and limited. <laughs> So Mullen debating his uh, sequencing here. Looks like he's going to wind up playing a tapped land, and he has four, potentially five mana to work with, depending on if he wants to cast Weirding Woods, Spring to Mind. Also a fair question of what he's going to even cast Weirding Wood on. So Weirding Wood goes on uh, Shrine of the Forsaken Gods, gets the clue. So he'll tap two mana there. He'll use one of those two mana to cast... Inspector plays a land tapped, has a pair of clues to work with. Oh, geez, it's another basic plane. So neither the best nor the worst draw Corey could have gotten. He, he can now spend four mana at worst, adding a counter to Walking Ballista. And I think that's the only option he has right now. I think every card in his hand actually requires colorless mana to cast. Color screwed with the one color deck. Yeah. Never where you want to be, especially when you're in the third game in the semifinals of a major tournament. All right, Oblivion Sower coming down, doing the top four cards of Corey's library. Collins is going to pick up a Plains and an Ether Hub, exiling a Matter of Shaper and a Walking Ballista. The 
A lot of mana now here available to uh, Collins. I don't see a Worldbreaker in his hand. All right, I do see a Worldbreaker in his hand, but not an Ulamog just yet. <clears throat> really nice with Oblivion Sower that the lands enter the battlefield untapped. You can potentially just use them right away if you have something like a clue hanging around or a cheap spell in your hand. Or he's drawing another Eldrazi Displacer. I mean, it's just a 3-3 right now. He does not have any colorless mana. That 5-8 on the other side of the table does not look very exciting. And things are only going to get worse from here. Yeah, they are only going to get worse. We might see this game go on for a little while as Collins doesn't have a card. Ooh, yep. <laughs> perhaps I spoke too soon. That's a card that can end the game in short order. Um, probably just going to take out two lands on Baumeister's side of the battlefield. Yeah, that would not be surprising to me at all. He's going to attack for five here with the Oblivion Sower. Corey declines to block. Here's Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. A hungry monster to be sure. I believe Collins even has a Sanctum of Ugin in play. Yeah, he does. Chooses not to trigger it. So he already has that World Breaker. Corey. Warping well on the top of his deck, not good enough. Extends the hand, and Collins Mullen will advance to the finals of Grand Prix Washington, D.C. to face off against Matt Severa and his Mardu Vehicles deck. Don't go away. Don't go away, people. This is extremely exciting stuff. For Reed Duke, this is Jacob Van Lunen, and uh, we'll be back really soon with the finals here.